Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Metropole TV, the first 24-hour business channel here in Kenya and East Africa. This is The Smart Investor. I'm your host, Ali Khan Sachu, and it's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. We've got a great guest who's going to dive into the real estate market in the second half of this uh, show. But let's touch on a few things in, in the first half. Let's start with Kenya. We've had a lot of economic uh, releases. Um, yesterday, we had the World Bank uh, report on Kenya GDP. This report is the Kenya Economic Update. It's long awaited by everybody and everyone goes through it. So let me take you through some of the details of this report. They are estimating Kenya GDP will grow uh, by 5.7% in 2019 this year. The president said 6.3%. The World Bank is at 5.7%. There you see the range. And before you start telling me we can't eat GDP, which seems to be a response that is echoing from West to East Africa, people are saying these numbers, we're not feeling these numbers in our pockets. We're not feeling these numbers. Um, and therefore, let's, let's appreciate that fact. And the reason a lot of we're not experiencing it is because of population growth. So 5.7 needs to be cut in half because our populations are growing. And when you cut it in half, it doesn't look that great. And that's why on the ground, the experience might not be as bullish as it should be. And we'll have a look at the data points in a second. So they're expecting uh, 5.7 in 2019, slight decrease from 5.8 that we had last year. And what they're saying is drought, and uh, I was in Mombasa, we got a bit of rain there, but you could see it's very dry. Look, at, look outside in Nairobi, hot and dry. A few days late on the rainy season, people beginning to get nervous. We've had problems in the north and other places. So they're talking about drought and weak private sector investment. This is all about the fact that the government is the main elephant in the room. They're borrowing all the money and SME sector and others are not able to get credit. So what they're saying is private sector is lackluster. We've got to keep an eye on, on, on the weather. Um, uh, they're talking also saying, you know, we've got a comfortable buffer against external short-term shocks. And what they're talking about is foreign exchange reserves. We've got about eight months of import cover, the highest or close to the highest we've ever had. Um, uh, so there is some uh, safety. This is a safety net. And the reason we've got uh, these big reserves is because of remittances last year when we clocked $2.4 billion. And generally, we've been pretty good at foreign exchange management. So bear that in mind that, that you know we do have some good defenses. One of them is the foreign exchange uh, reserve. They're talking about debt to GDP. Look at this chart. What they're saying is that the debt has actually started to level off. Now, this will be good news for a lot of people. A lot of concerns about the trajectory, the speed with which we've accumulated this debt in the last few years. Questions around, are we getting value for money for all the borrowing we've done? But you can see here the World Bank is, is saying, look, you know, it's coming down. Uh, marginally, we need to keep it, I think, below 60%. I know a lot of people think there's more headroom, but when you're at 60%, a 10% move, a big currency move, can move that debt to GDP ratio much higher very quickly. This We saw this in Zambia. Wherever the currencies are weak, it's a problem. That's why I, for one, do not believe a weak currency is any help to us. I saw an article in one of the papers saying we should devalue the currency. Why? What on earth for? All our debt ratios will go out of whack and we'll have further and bigger problems. We are a net importing economy. You devalue the currency. It doesn't really make a great deal of difference, in my, in my opinion. World Bank said, notwithstanding underperformance in revenues, we're not collecting as much as we thought we would. But that seems to be how what happens every single year. Um, we, we, put, we project much higher numbers than we actually collect. So they're saying, look, we're not performing on the revenue side. 
but the fiscal deficit has narrowed to 6.8%. The fiscal deficit is the difference between what we are uh, able to collect in revenue versus how much we're spending. So we're still in negative territory, but it's narrowing now. Um, and they're saying that's because of a significant contraction in development expenditure um, and a marginal decrease in recurrent expenditures. So they're saying we're not spending as much on development projects and we've kind of got some control over the recurrent expenditure, which to me is the real issue. Our recurrent expenditure is too high and it, and it crowds everything else out. And bear in mind, there are a lot of people saying about $2.2 billion is owed to various people in this economy by the government, and that's not showing on the balance sheet or in these numbers. It's in a kind of limbo, but everyone is aware of it. So bear that also in mind. World Bank said it was all about favorable weather, um, explains the 2018 rebound last year. So, you know, we had good rains last year. I'm sure you remember. I certainly do. And it was the agricultural sector that lifted our economy. And the good thing about the agricultural sector is a lot of people have a shamba somewhere, they are invested in the land, uh, so you get a good diffusion. It's not just a few people benefiting, it's a lot of people in the country. When the rains are good, you feel it, food prices stay low, everyone's got enough food in order to feed their families, and that's always a positive sign. But the point I, make, I want to make here is you need to be a meteorologist, i.e. a climate specialist, if you want to understand African economies. Because when you have good rains, it makes such a big difference, such a positive impact. And when you have a drought, what happens? Food prices spike, inflation goes up, and everything kind of goes out of whack and a little bit haywire. So the worry is we had good rains last year, we might not get them this year. That's why everyone's looking up at the skies and hoping, uh, like myself, for a bit of rain. And therefore our farmers and our food stocks can get replenished. This was another interesting data point about Kenya. The average contribution, the three-year average contribution to GDP growth from private investment, that's people out there doing business, that's, you know, that's non-government spending, um, uh, was at 2.7% three years ago, and now is it less than 1%, 0.7%. That tells you about the crowding out effect that I was talking about a little bit earlier. You can see the private sector is very, very anemic. It is not, it is not robust, it is not muscular at this point in time, and it needs to be encouraged. It's a little bit like a patient etherized upon a table. We need to get this patient up and get it going. And the question is, how are we going to do that? Uh, Jared Osoro, who is the chief economist at Kenya Bankers Association, said this, we're seeing weakness in enterprise levels with persistence on NPLs, what is non-performing loans when the economy is soft, non-performing loans go up. And he says a growth of 1% in GDP leads to a decline of 1% of NPLs. But we're not seeing that happen essentially because of that crowding out effect, the fact that the government is the biggest borrower and their liquidity is being drained from other people and that's something that needs to be sorted out and he's referencing that. And then this other point I think is important. A higher failure rate of firms could increase the cost of capital risk premia and the government's cost of future orders could rise as suppliers build in the anticipated financing costs. What they're saying is the government's not paying on time, it's paying late, in some cases it still owes money. This is the $2.2 billion um, uh, figure that uh, you will remember a couple of weeks ago. Uh, James Muruyu from uh, Kenya National Chamber, uh, you know, was talking to us about this and saying, look, all I want the government to do is pay its bills and get rid of this outstanding amount because people are suffering. And the World Bank is saying, look, if you don't do that, everyone's going to price you in much more expensive next time because they're never sure when they'll actually receive their money. So that's an interesting point. You, 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 you penalize people who pay you late 
And the World Bank is saying, you know, the government's going to start getting a penalty for paying, paying everybody late. I saw an announcement uh, from Equity Bank, this is Dr. James Mwangi, that they're going to establish, issue, and allot employee share ownership plan. This is about 5%. They're going to allot about 5% of shares to their employees. So this is a dilution. What does that mean? There are going to be more shares in issue. The good thing is for any bank to give shares to your employees or any company is always a good thing. To create ownership amongst your staff is always a positive sign. So I'm not arguing with that. What I am concerned about is there is a gratuity um, being made. I think it's 50 million shillings to, Dr. Uh, to Mr. Munga, who was the chairman of Equity Bank. And I think it's investors, particularly because there are many global investors in Equity Bank, will take issue with that. And I'm not sure that was a, was a uh, optimal move by Equity Bank. So keep an eye on how the market reacts to that uh, gratuity that's being paid. I understand, of course, Dr. Munger was one of the founders. He's now retiring. But corporate governance would say that you would not be, you would not be paying this kind of reward in this manner. But let's see how the market responds. Let's move on to, we were talking about the World Bank and the Kenya report. The IMF also, this is Madame uh, Christine Lagarde, who's the MD at the IMF. Um, they're also issuing uh, their World Economic Outlook, and that's another worldwide look at what's going on, how well is the world doing, and this is what we learned uh, from them. And I'm just going to focus firstly on Africa, Ghana will be the fastest growing country in sub-Saharan Africa and the world. That's really, they've overtaken Ethiopia, this is the prediction, and uh, I thought that was very noteworthy. The big beasts in Africa, the big economies in sub-Saharan Africa are actually South Africa, Nigeria, and Angola, and they are really in the slow lane. In most cases, they're growing at below 2%, below population growth. That means people are becoming worse off every year. Um, and the question is how to encourage uh, those economies back to a faster growth path. But, you know, this has been the case now in South Africa since President Zuma came to power. Now we've got Ramaphosa who's trying to change some of the things that Zuma did. Some people estimate that the South African economy would be 30% bigger if President Zuma had not been in power. And we'll talk about uh, what they mean by that another time. Nigeria, Baba Go Slow is the nickname. They've gone real slow on the economy. They still have this uh, voodoo FX regime where you have two FX exchange rates. Um, and Angola, of course, recovering from the oil crisis some years ago the departure of a long-standing uh, leader, President Dos Santos. So, but, you know, he in Angola is making the right economic moves in my, in, in my view. Ethiopia is the fastest growing economy in our region. And the interesting point is East Africa, actually, as a region, is the fastest growing region. But uh, Ethiopia, I think 7.7% or thereabouts. Um, and it's been growing at this very, very fast rate for quite a while. Then, uh, st sticking with uh, uh, Africa, um, they're also talking about East Africa, saying Kenya 5.8%, Ethiopia 77 DRC, where President Shishikedi was in Washington only last week, and he's made his uh, previous president, Kabila, very unhappy because he was talking about corruption in the previous regime. He's refused to accept President Kabila's suggestion for prime minister. And he seems to be encouraged to try and escape the leash that President Kabila has on him. Um, uh, president Kabila famously was interviewed in January and uh, about his departure. And he quoted Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'll be back, he never went. So the problem here in DRC Congo is how does Shishikedi manage to uh, assert himself, uh, gain control, and you can see all the Western powers from the US to France, Emmanuel Macron, who met with him he here when he was visiting, all telling him, you know what, you've got to now assert yourself 
um, with President, uh, ex-President Kabila, but it's not easy. But they're predicting 4.3%. Now, the big hit has actually been Tanzania. Tanzania has been at growing at 65 to 7% for the last decade, right? What, are, what is the IMF predicting for this year? 4%. That is slow. So what they're saying essentially is that the consequences of Magafuli nomics, which we've seen in the cashew nuts where he bought up all the cashew nuts, he didn't like the prices that the inter international markets were prepared to pay. But what's happened? He didn't have the storage. The cashew nuts have gone stale. The income last year from cashew nuts was one third of what it normally was. And this is not, you need basically, if you're going to do that, you're going to fight the global markets, you better have storage. And you better have good storage. For something like cashew nuts, no one wants to eat them when they're stale, so they're worth nothing. So it's been a real tough point here. And here you see the IMF saying, you know what? It's, it's, he's slowed down the economy. The question is, has he slowed it down in order to clean it up and it can grow faster? Or is this, is this another thing altogether? That's for us to find out, I suppose, at a future date. Um, I, was, I follow a gentleman called Gregory Smith, who's at Renaissance Capital, and he says the key drivers of African debt is government spending overruns, they're spending too much, money they don't have, revenue falling, so they're not collecting enough money, um, exchange rate depreciation, that's why I was telling you Kenya cannot afford the shilling to fall, because it would really it would cause a big problem in all our debt metrics and negative growth, he's citing Angola and Namibia. The other thing is, 10, 15 years ago, our borrowing was concessional. It was cheap. In some cases, it was free. Today, we've gone to the Eurobond markets. African issuers have issued over $100 billion in those Eurobond markets, and the Eurobond markets are not cheap. They give you the money quick, but they charge you for it. So there has been this metasizing of African debt from cheap concessional money into much more expensive money and, he's, and that is also something that we need to keep in mind. Now, let's take a look at what's going on further afield. Sudan, have you been watching the screens? Here, President Bashir, um, you know, I call him a political Harry Houdini, otherwise he would not have lasted for so long. He's been there for 30 years and every time people think he's going, he doesn't. But today, if you look at the street in Khartoum, they're right at army headquarters. Um, there are thousands, if not millions, of people on the streets. This is people power that we haven't seen. We saw it in Algeria, but we haven't seen it that much below the Sahara, have we? So I wrote in January that these are the last days or the end times, but the last days or end times can take quite a long time to play out, actually. Here, in this photograph, you see that Sudanese slept uh, on the street. They, they, are, they prayed their Muslim Fajr prayers on the street. They refused to leave the street until Bashir leaves. And the question is, how long will President Bashir hang on? This has become an iconic photograph. This is a lady standing up. A lot of people have been commenting on how a lot of these protests have been led by women in particular. This photograph that you're seeing here has gone round the world and everyone's talking about it. And this was a description from a journalist at The Guardian named Jason Burke. He says, the revolution will not be televised, but it will be live streamed, Facebooked, tweeted, Instagrammed, WhatsApped, etc etc brave woman what an image and indeed it is it's a massive display of people power lit by smartphone accompanied by chance for revolution the people want to overthrow the regime in sudan you know what started the crisis in sudan was a tripling in bread prices and you know bread prices have always triggered revolutions the world over if you can't produce cheap food for your people eventually they can't feed themselves and they reach the end of the road and it was a big failure particularly when you consider sudan has lots of fertile land but they leased it for 99 and 100 years to countries in the gulf for their food security 
The irony is Bashir gave food security to other countries, did not give it to his own people, and that was the catalyst for what we're watching now, the end of Bashir. And just to give you that quote, uh, two quotes actually, one is from, a, from the time of the Iranian Revolution, and this was a Polish writer who was there at the time, and he says, if the crowd disperses, goes home, does not reassemble, we say the revolution is over. You can say in Algeria and in Sudan, the crowd did not disperse, it's not gone home, it's staying on the street, it's praying on the street, it refuses to go home, it is reassembling, and the revolution is not over. In fact, the regime is at this point over. Now, let's go to the world uh, economic outlook. The IMF says the global economy is going to grow 3.3% this year. This is the slowest rate of growth since 2009, a 10-year low. And uh, that's a bit of a worry. And uh, the chief economist who's uh, at the IMF, Gita Gopinath, Indian lady, says this is a delicate moment. She's putting it delicately as it were. And indeed, we've got to keep an eye on what's happening around us. They talk about the US-China tariff war. They talk about Europe. They're talking about a bunch of risks that are out there and which can come back and affect us. Brexit, of course, and you know, you, you can't underestimate. I talk a lot about Brexit, but Brexit is important to us. We are a big trading partner for the United Kingdom. All our fresh vegetables, green beans, tea, they drink a lot of tea. Um, a, a lot of these exports go to Britain. So any uncertainty there will, of course, create blowback for us. So let's not underestimate what's happening in the United Kingdom. It remains murky and it remains unclear to me where it's all going to end. But so far, what we do know is um, Theresa May is asking for an extension to, I think it's the um, end of May or end of June. And the Europeans are saying, we're fed up of you coming here every two weeks wanting an extension. We're going to give you a flex extension. You can have a whole year. And if you don't need that whole year, you can go quicker or you can use up the whole year. So that is a, that's an interesting point to just consider. But the bottom line is the Europeans have the United Kingdom where they want it. And the question is, how does the United Kingdom navigate from this point in time? Mario Draghi, the ECB's uh, 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 central bank governor of the European Commercial Bank, struck a very negative note today. He's talking about the European economy being very weak. He warned of risks weighing on growth in the Eurozone, describing current economic indicators as weak. He says the risks surrounding the Euro area growth outlook remain tilted to the downside on account of the persistence of uncertainties related to geopolitical factors, the threat of protectionism and vulnerabilities in emerging markets. He must be referring to Turkey where the currency continues to come under a lot of pressure. He, however, says the estimated probability of recession is quite low. So that's, that's an interesting point uh, uh, on that. But let's keep an eye on the European economy. Uh, I remember in the old days they used to call uh, it, it, the sick man of Europe. Let's hope it's not going to be very sick and they can make a recovery. Let me finish with uh, King Bibi, Bibi Netanyahu, Prime Minister and best friend of, Prime Minister of Israel and best friend of Trump and Bolsonaro of Brazil and quite a character. Um, he, he won a ele general election in Israel for the fifth time, which is really quite something. Um, it will be a right-wing government. Oh, yes, it's very right-wing. You know, Trump gifted him the Golan Heights, of course, which belonged to Syria, frankly, but were uh, spoils of war and, and under international law. You can't just grab a piece of a country. Otherwise, you know, Uganda could have grabbed half of those islands in Lake Victoria. Oh, I forgot. They might have done. But anyway, the point is you can't go around grabbing other people's parts of other people's country which is something that Trump seems to allow, have allowed Bibi to do. So big election win for Bibi. He still has got a, cor a corruption scandal hanging over him, and we're going to have to see how he deals with that.
but really, you know, the most powerful defense against this kind of corruption, ICC, is to stay in power. Whilst you're in power, they can't come and get you. The day you come out of power, that's when they come and find you. And that must be something that must be on Bashir's mind as well. So I thank you for uh, uh, listening to the first half of the show. Please give us your reactions. Come over Twitter, get in touch with us. This is Metropole TV. This is The Smart Investor. My name is Ali Khan Satchu, and we're going to take a dive into a market that's on everyone's mind, real estate. Is it going to crash? Is it not? We've got a great guest, Michael Mugambi. He's from CBRE Accelerate, and he's going to give us a sort of lowdown on what's going on. There's a big conference going on today and tomorrow. That's the East African Property Investment Summit. That's been at the Radisson. He's coming back from that. Um, he's going to talk to us about, about what's happening in the second half. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back. Thank you for listening. This is Metropole TV, the first 24-hour business channel here in Kenya and East Africa. My name is Ali Khan Sachi. See you in a moment. Welcome back to Metropole TV, the first 24-hour business channel. This is The Smart Investor. My name is Ali Khan Sachu, and we've got a great guest here for the second half, Michael Mugambi, the Advisory and Transactions Manager at CBRE Accelerate. Yes. Michael, thank you for making the time. Thank Michael, you I know you've been attending this sixth annual East African Property Investment Summit, but before I go to this, I just want to, everyone is worried about this property market, okay. right? Yeah. I meet people who, you know, who stop me on the street, what's going on, and uh, very nervous. Why don't you give your, firstly, tell us, where are we? I mean, it's been remarkable the last 10 years. You mm -hmm. bought anything, you would be, you know, you made fantastic returns. Yeah. Are those days over? Are, are the, is the easy money already been had? Are you worried that this, that the property market is now under pressure? Um, not so much. The beauty about it is that uh, the real estate market is cyclic, so it yes. goes in cycles. And at the moment, it depends with the sector that you're looking at. Um, so, for example, um, the real estate is divided into office, industrial, and retail, and residential. Yes. So the guys who are worried... Um, Probably at the moment, I would say from where we sit um, as a company will be um, the office sector. Office, but you are in the commercial space. Yeah, we yes. are in the commercial space. And when you say worried, is that because we've oversupplied the market? Yes, because there's an oversupply. It's uh, it's literally a tenant's market. Yes. Uh, in recent times, there have been uh, buildings being delivered um, with a slow uptick. That when you say slow uptake, what do you mean? So let's say, you know, we've got some iconic buildings out there. Mm -hmm. uh, Old Mutual, every time I come from the airport, I see that. And when, when you say slow uptake, what, what are we talking about? Um, the, the demand wasn't enough, it wasn't uh, enough. To, to meet that supply. Because you had this, um, you can call it a wave mm. of development. All of a sudden, it's... Um, um, it was like the quail business. Everyone yes. was like, property. Is that, is, so is that a Kenyan thing do you, that we all flock to something? Or is it? Uh, yeah, um, unfortunately, it is a trend. Um, and I know some investors out there might kill me for saying that. Yes. Because here you're talking about uh, large amounts of investments. But Huge. unfortunately, yeah. But unfortunately, it happened that people just um, decided to develop a good number of buildings at the same time. And the demand was just not there to meet it. And the other problem is that people were still developing, you know, like uniform properties. So what, there's, they're not, they're not, there's no granularity in the yeah, offering? Yeah, there's no differentiating factors to them. You know, what, whatever amenities you'll find in building A, you'll find in building B. So if you were, if you're an advisor to uh, office, to retail and to industrial, if you're speaking to people in the office space, mm -hmm. what are you telling them? Deliver what? I mean... Is it an iconic building like the bendy one in Upper Hill? <laughs> is, it, is it having the tallest one? Or what, what, what are you telling them to differentiate themselves with? Um, to grade one, grade two? Yeah, grade, uh, grade, a, grade but, a, but by international standards. Yes. Because um, to be honest, uh, from my interactions with also our other offices around the world, 
when we talk about grade A here in Kenya, it's probably um, a grade B or a grade B plus on an international pedestal. And you're saying we, we got to do grade A? We got to do grade A, but the only challenge that landlords will say or investors will say is the cost of grade producing a. grade A properties and the mm -hmm. rentals associated with them. Would you get the rental uplift if you do grade A? Yeah, certainly. Um, there's one building in Nairobi right now that's achieving above market rentals. Which one's that? Uh, Vienna Court. And why is it doing that? Because um, it's, I'm not saying it be, because I like the building, but yes. it's literally been uh, termed as the best building in Nairobi currently. Wow. Yeah. So, you're, so people will pay for yeah. good product? Yeah, they will pay for good product. In fact, um, a report, I think, was it by, by mentor management was saying that there was an opportunity and still is an opportunity for um, high grade high and grade a um, developments office to achieve of, yeah office blocks mm. to achieve um, above market rentals that's interesting yeah, so that's the yeah. space you're if you were if i'm an investor and i want to build a big you know tower you tell me that's what the way to go forward right yeah um i'd, I'd really um invest in the feasibility study of it yes um yeah and look at what will differentiate that building from what's available in the market and then people will respond to that. So let me ask you another question. Uh, you know, what is the oversupply amount? I mean, do we have any idea? What are we talking about in terms um, of square feet or square meters or whatever? Um, unfortunately, the challenge with uh, Nairobi's real estate market is, is, is data as well. We oh, don't it's have, murky. Yeah, we don't have data about uh, the, uh, the number of buildings in terms of square footage that yes. are available. Uh, from grade A, grade B, all those kind of things. When you look at uh, more developed markets, those that's information you find yes. readily at hand, probably even on the internet. When you yeah, for Dubai, flip. for example, yeah. you know, you could get everything. I yeah. was looking at some of that. That's been a tough market. But let me give you this example. I saw, you know, when I visited, I went to, what's that? Burj Khalifa. Yeah, Burj Khalifa, yeah. Those apartments, two bedrooms, was being sold for $1 million at one time. Today, they're $400,000. That's not expensive when yeah. you compare it to us. Yeah, mm. yeah. Sorry, let me... So, so okay, oversupplied. Uh, let's touch on some of the other spaces. Yeah. Everyone talking about retail, Michael. Yeah. Now, let me ask you one question. Mm -hmm. I, I sort of sit there and I look at everybody. Everyone's got a smartphone. I was in the UK, everyone's doing e-commerce. Are we on a, like a moment when everything changes and suddenly when and people are missing that trick in the retail sector? Uh, I mean, are these, what you were telling me just earlier, and I can't uh, disagree with you, when you go mm. into most of these malls, it's the same shops. Yeah. There are very few diff different things. Yeah, um, the, the tenant mix, um, the retail offering in the market um, is not mature yet. Mm. Um, because, and that coupled by the, when you're looking at Nairobi alone, for example, yes. the number of retail developments in Nairobi, coupled by the same tenant offerings, um, one of the things that says is uh, landlord risk, Yes, high landlord risk, because these tenants literally will dictate whatever lease terms um, when going into these spaces, we've seen uh, people doing turnover rents mm. as, as opposed to the this normal... Is, this is car four, right? Yeah. Uh, Ooh, yeah. I, I can't say. That's, that's <laughs> what I, 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 I'm speculating, yeah, but that's yeah, what I heard. Yeah. That's how they... um, you know, turnover rents and, you know, rent reductions mm. after a short period of lease. Um, because, you see, um, Ali, it doesn't make uh, sense for me to have two shops close to each other. Mm. Um, I'd rather have one, keep my business expenses low. And if you want me to come into that development that's close to this other one, mm. you really have to incentivize it. Mm. And that's really hurting landlords because the tenant mix is not mature yet. That still, that, that being said, it presents an opportunity for the, a good number of the informal retailers to come into this space and at fill this that time, gap. At this time, when, when yeah. they're getting good deals. Yeah, yes. yeah, and just try out that formal retail and see how it is. And also, uh, that will contribute to the growth of the retail market as a whole. Give me an example of somebody who's done that informal into formal retail. Uh, is there any example? Um, or, you're, or you're suggesting this could be something yeah, new that would help? Yeah, sometimes yeah. I look at the shops that you find in town, in CBD, mm. and I just wonder you know, if these guys um, will go into... Uh, retail developments that are probably in the neighborhoods and save mm. these pe people the trouble of coming all the way to town to mm. get the products. 
um, to, it's an opportunity for them to tap into the formal retail sector. Yeah. You have, we've been speaking, we've been a bit Nairobi centric. Which, yes. Yes. Yeah. Tell me about, you know, with post evolution, I go to places which I remember going to as a young boy, and there's been development. You yeah. know, yeah. Uh, these towns have grown, these cities have become bigger, and you yeah. see that you've. Would you be advising people to look outside Nairobi because of the glut you're describing right now? Better opportunities out there or not? Um, uh, it's a song I've been singing actually. I've been I've been telling people that um, you know the opportunity that existed in Nairobi about in the 50s and 60s. Yes. It's the same opportunity that exists in the counties now. Wow. Yeah. So if somebody was to have a futuristic mindset and look at uh, the opportunities that lie within the the counties, and also specifically look at the the, the spending culture because mm. that's also an important aspect of um, the what counties. What do you mean by that? How much money people disposable income or um, the attitude? Are, are the, they the, consumers? The spending culture. Take for example the retail sector. Yeah. Um, um, if we were to meet um, here in Nairobi, you and I, mm. we'll probably go to a, a, a fancy restaurant, probably a Java mm. or an art cafe, and have a meeting. As opposed to currently in the probably in some counties in the rural areas, would we'll, we'll, we'll meet at either at your place or yes. my place and just yes. save that not spend any money at all. Yes, is, oh, yeah. is that is that a fact? Yeah. So mm. I mean, the spending culture there also has to be carefully looked at mm. because there is an appetite for these amenities that are in Nairobi, as mm. people there say. Um, but then it has to be also right for them for them to. Uh, change their spending culture and habits. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Now, the other yeah. component in your business at CBRE mm -hmm. is industrial. Yeah. Is that warehousing and what, what is industrial when you say, it? what does it mean? Industrial means uh, warehousing, logistics, um, manufacturing. And when um, I look at, to be honest, Michael, when I look at capital raising, there's been a yeah. lot of capital going to warehousing. Yes. Right? Yeah. So what's, tell us what's happening in that space and what, what you are seeing and mm. you know, how is that performing, that space? Okay. It's, it's a similar story to the office space sector. It's there, oversupply. There, there is, um, not necessarily, but there is a demand um, for modern grade A warehousing and logistics. And there isn't um, at the moment? There or? isn't at the moment. Mm. I can tell you for a fact, we were doing um, a space search for one of our clients um, in the traditional industrial area. Mm. It's the Embakasi area, Mombasa Road. And literally, you couldn't find anything that stood out. Um, everything is just the same. It's the, the yes. old industrial stock. And then there was this, uh, I think, three to four, probably five years ago, this new nodes, sub-industrial nodes came came. Came about Babadogos, yes, Roraka, and all these other places, Mlolongo, yes, um, that offered do just they newer, have, just like, newer do they have facilities, infrastructure, or? yeah, just it's just newer facilities, mm. yeah, and cheaper rentals, mm. um, um, and and then you came, then came in like Tattoo City, yes, who just came in and people like uh, ALP, mm. who just came in and did the proper warehousing and logistics facilities. It was at the first I, grade A logistics facility, ALP? ALP, I, I would say yeah. yes, yeah, probably, mm. yeah, because I, had, I hadn't had seen anything mm. um, that's close to that. And do you think, I remember being in Europe, you know, you'd have self-storage, you know, because everyone would be moving around, you'd, you know, are these markets coming here as well? I mean, e-commerce came, Uber yeah. became uh, the biggest taxi company in three months. Yeah. Is there a great disruption that's coming or would you, or would you say, no, it's not coming yet? Um, it's, it's on its way. Mm. Um, um, primarily what's happened, especially um, the leaders, I think, will be the big retailers, international mm. retailers, um, because they mostly import their stuff mm. and they currently utilize, I think, the like smaller warehouses. I was reading that in a report just today. And then in future, they'll want something that's centralized mm. and really works for them mm. logistically and in terms of amenities. So there is an opportunity that mm. will come, definitely. Um, and that's why you see these type of companies and this type of logistics parks being created because they are positioning them, positioning themselves for, for this uh, yeah for this trend. Let, let me now jump you to I think Knight Frank also took the opportunity of this particular summit to yeah. issue a report Africa Horizons yeah. and I was just going through it yeah 
and uh, they're identifying niche markets. They're mm -hmm. saying, look, student accommodation is a big deal. Yeah. Elderly care is another market. Talk us through some of the niche markets that are developing that you think we should keep an interest in. Um, I think the student housing accommodation is a problem that has been there for quite some time, even yeah. since the time that I was in campus. Um, there wasn't enough student accommodation, so definitely there is a gap there. Mm. And what has been available, again, comes down to the quality of the offering. You know, people are just doing, you know, like bare minimums, mm. um, small rooms, you know, you know, students also, on the other hand, you know, just maybe don't mind as much. Yes. But you've seen other people who've come in and, and are trying to change that game. People like Kwetu Residences mm. and have done some really good student accommodation, and there's a big opportunity for that. Um, when it comes to the elderly, to the elderly yes. um, somebody came to me and said, Ali Khan, this is the next big business. We're going to have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the Ali, culture is changing, this guy was saying. He said, you know, before you wouldn't let your parents go into an environment like that. Today they might ask you to go in there. You know what? I was going right into that because mm. that really touches. It's a cul cultural thing. Yes. Yeah, it definitely is a cultural it, thing. Because, you mean it doesn't work for us. We don't. Um, at the moment, uh, maybe not as mm. much. Mm. But maybe in the future, yes, because um, this urbanization, Western influence, whatever people call it, it's it's real and, and it's happening. Mm. Um, but at the moment, you you wouldn't find like people so eager to take their, you know, the elderly, their parents to and drop them somewhere, drop them somewhere yeah. to be taken care of. What I've seen actually um, from my experience, the, uh, places like those take care of people who've either been abandoned mm. or have special needs. Mm. So when it comes to like where somebody consciously just decides, okay, fine, I'm going to take my grandparent to a place, a home. We're, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. I, mm. I, 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 I don't think we are, but we will get there. Yeah, so there is an opportunity, albeit a futuristic one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then I saw a tweet by the CS Tourism Najibalala, and he was talking about saying there's an enormous opportunity for elderly care for Western people to come here and to and to look after. Do you think that is an opportunity? <laughs> 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 that they're already wow. sent their grandparents to us. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's that's even a greater wild card than that's than even more futuristic. Yeah, um, I'm, I I don't know unless I mean if unless you look at it from a point of uh, from from a commercial perspective, yes. where somebody will just say, um, "I'll run it like a business, no emotions involved, mm. um, get those guys in, I'll employ people to take care of them, I'll make my money, mm. and that's it." Mm. Yeah, yeah. Now, unless you look at it like that. Okay. Yeah. Now, you know, big four, big four, big four business, affordable housing yeah. is a key plank of the president's future legacy. And he's been talking a lot about it. And yeah. I believe we're now being taxed with the housing <laughs> levy. Um, yeah. Tell us, what did you hear today? What, what are you thinking about that? Is this doable right now? Mm -hmm. Are we seeing a forward motion? Um, have they got the right model? Yeah. Have they got the right price point? Yeah. Or are we wishful thinking? Um, I think it's still in the very early stages from what I picked up today. Um, unfortunately, the, um, the, the PS for State um, Housing and Urban Development wasn't able to make it, but he will be there tomorrow to just shed more light on it. Um, but from the conversations I picked up today, it's still in the formative stages because you have the the Kenya Property Developers Association, with their questions, KEPSA have their own questions about it. There's a whole question about protecting the, the people who it's meant for. Mm. Um, because you tax people, the money will come out, the developers will come out, and the big investor will come and buy all the units and lock out. Yes, uh, that would be a disaster. Yeah, that's a disaster. So uh, questions like those are still being raised and the perception about what we've been seeing in the media, we were saying just a few minutes mm. ago, um, you know, also really influences because um, as, as an ordinary Kenyan, you wonder, um, I'm being asked to give out more money. Mm. Um, will it go to the housing project or mm. will it be pocketed by someone? Um, if only there were some successful projects um, before mm. that had been delivered by the government, then I think the perception will have been more positive and people will have been upbeat about the project. But um, I think so when you look at the society, uh, the perception is 
probably not so good about yeah. it, and the concerns still remain um, are quite a number. Final yeah. question. Yeah. Is the glass half full or half empty? <laughs> <laughs> Why do we ask such questions? Because uh, this is the question on every, everyone sort of says, you know, what do you, how do you read it? Um, I'd look at it from a perspective of being half full. Mm. Um, because um, wherever there are problems, um, there's also opportunities. Mm. And, and there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of opportunities um, for development. Um, for maturity of some sectors like the retail sectors mm. um, for example even the office sector there's still hope because um, the number of new developments in the pipeline has gone down and so the market will you to come back into it yeah will 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 self-adjust at mm. some point maybe in the medium or the longer term but it will mm. and um, then the investors will get their yields back although it might take them longer mm. Um, and even when you look at the cuts across even the residential sector, what's happening in the industrial sector is also very exciting. It's going to pull in a lot of um, foreign direct investment, um, game-changing service providers. Uh, we've seen with the international retailers, people are now enjoying the offerings in the mm. supermarkets. You know, when uh, things were happening with the, the re retailers that went down, people were worried. It's going to happen, and then the international retailers came in. So it's there's um, you can only go you know so so far down. Yes. Yeah, that's what I'd say. So it's it it will be positive, but it will take some time. Michael, you remind me of a song by Billy Ocean: "When the going gets tough, Michael Mugambi gets going." <laughs> <laughs> pleasure having you on the show. Yeah, pleasure. Well, thank it's you so much. Well. Thank you so much for inviting me. We look me. forward to having you again. All right, great. Thanks thank a lot, you. man. Thank All you. Right, cheers. This was All Metropole right. TV, 24-hour business channel. That was my guest, Michael Mugambi of CBRE Accelerate. This is the Smart Investor. We're on here daily, 8 to 9 p.m. We look forward to speaking with you tomorrow. Thank you for watching.